when we look at blood sugar, when someone does a really strenuous workout or when they sauna, a lot of times blood sugar will go up. Adrenaline and cortisol, it's a stress on the body. Your liver is you know, releasing stored sugars and dumping it into your bloodstream so you have a little bit of energy, but you're also losing a lot of water. You're getting dehydrated. So yeah. then you're talking about, it's almost like taking balsamic vinegar and making like a reduction. Like <laughs> your, your blood volume is going down. And so the quantity of sugar in your blood is actually, you know, it's more. What are the biggest mistakes that people make when trying to get healthy? I think they do everything at one time. So the New Year's is rolling in and they're going, well, I don't really love the food I'm eating and I don't have a workout routine and my job is really stressful. And I always feel like I'm drinking from a hot fire hose every single day when it comes to the things I have to manage. And if anyone out there is a parent on top of like taking care of yourself, then you're also taking care of small humans. And <laughs> so there's a lot on your plate. Um, but I, when I'm working with clients, it's looking at, okay, how do we get strategic? Instead of looking at January 1st as the time when I'm going to implement all of these things, how can you implement a resolution or a plan, a strategic habit every single month? So maybe you have an idea that you want to get healthier with your food and you're excited about intermittent fasting and you want to try a new diet. Like, let's just, let's put it in order. Like mm. what is most important to you? What's going to have the biggest impact and what's the lowest hanging fruit? And let's get strategic over the next 12 months. Let's have a year long plan for wellness because it doesn't happen overnight, mm. but there are ways that we can clean it up. I love that. So like what, what do you do when you have a client who comes to you with like a list of all the things that they want to integrate, right? They've been, they've been listening to your podcast, my podcast. They come in with like, okay, I got to get my sleep right. I got to start going to the gym and, and doing all these different exercise modalities. I got to get my diet cleaned up. I got to start integrating these very specific micronutrients because of what they can do to my immune system, blah, blah, blah. And they have like this like laundry list of things that they need to do. It can, it can be overwhelming. Right. So where do they begin? Well, it needs to not be a push. It needs to be a habit or something that pulls you to do it. So for example, you mentioned sleep hygiene. And we've talked on my podcast about how you have the salt rock lamp in your room and mm. automatically by using, by purchasing that and having that in your home, you're using that instead of using your overhead lights. Well, you had this, you know, the knowledge to know that bright lights and blue lights disrupt your circadian rhythm. They impact your body's production of melatonin. Okay, great. You're just not going to stop. You're not going to get up and turn off your lights. We yeah. got to replace that habit. So I'm all about replacing instead of removing and trying to use our brain or action to create something. So by bringing in the pink salt lamp, now all of a sudden that's a fun thing that you do. You turn it on. It's easy. And then you're going like, yeah, I'm not using the overhead lights anymore. It's dark out. I'm, I have this beautiful ambient light. And it wasn't effort. And it was actually, we brought it, we brought it into my environment and it becomes easy. So we have to take inventory of what, what habits you already have. And we need to understand how can we support creating new habits by setting up your physical space to do that. So an example, you mentioned taking supplements and micronutrients. So for my clients, if say, for example, they drink coffee in the morning and they never drink a glass of water and they forget to take their supplements. Well, coffee takes a minute to drip. Hmm. So we set out a glass of water by the coffee, by the, your coffee maker. And it's, you hit the coffee, then you fill up the water. When you fill up the water, the supplements are by the coffee. They're not in your bathroom. Wow. So we're setting up your physical space so that it's easier to, and James Clear of Atomic Habits, if you haven't had the chance to interview him, he is amazing, first of all, but that's called habit stacking. It's really getting into the, into your life and saying, how do I set up my physical environment to have triggers that create and allow this habit to continue and to so I can be consistent with it, right? Yeah. I'm sure there are th things in your life that you've set up that way you don't even realize. Yeah. No, I love this. I I actually I've made it um my my mission uh over the past couple of weeks to start meditating. I'd been trained to meditate years ago, but uh I I never I never did it. And um, it just became one of those things like, you know, you buy a treadmill for your house and it just becomes a, an expensive, you know, clothing rack. Yeah. So that's sort of what the skill of meditation has become for me. But I started seeing a therapist over the past eight months and I, you know, she thinks it's really important. Like the work that you do in between sessions, a big part of that is meditating. And so to make it easy for myself, I set up this habit now where when I wake up in the morning, I don't. So my bedroom is on the second floor and the kitchen is down down below on the first floor. And what I do is I don't go downstairs. I just go straight from my bed to pee. And then I have a yoga mat laid out in front of my bed at all times. I don't roll it up 
So I'm like lowering the friction, right? And I just sit on that yoga mat with my back up against my, my bed frame. And for 20 minutes, I use an app called Insight Timer. And I'm now meditating every morning for 20 minutes. And I've missed a morning here or there. And I'm not, sure. I don't, you know, I'm not like hard on myself when I do, but I've made it as easy as possible for myself to like stack that habit on top of like, you know, the, the waking up, pro the waking up routine. And I think you hit the nail on the head there. You said you, you took the friction away. You're yeah. not rolling that mat up. And I think we need to embrace, I mean, you can jump on Pinterest and see these beautiful homes that are perfectly curated. But the thing is like my infrared sauna is in our living room along with a Peloton and some, you know, free weights and things like that. And it drives my husband crazy. But I'm like, if, if this infrared sauna was outside and covered with a cover and I had to like go outside and I live in California, so it's not freezing, but to go outside, take the cover off, turn it on. Like I literally can start working out, turn it on. It's heating up while I'm working out. And then I'll jump in for 20 minutes versus the friction of, oh, now I need to like go outside and turn it on. It'll be warm in 45 minutes and it's just not going to happen. So how do you take the friction out of your life to make wellness really easy? Or how do you have something that comes to you or supports you to do the things you want to do. So for example, if I had a client who wanted to cook more, you know, they get really excited in the beginning of the year. I'm on a meal plan and prep. I'm going to spend eight hours on a Sunday. I mean, that, that's my worst nightmare. Like I love a meal prep light. I love mise en place, which is basically like bringing my veggies in, washing them, chopping them, putting them in glass Pyrex in my fridge so that they're easier, mm. like taking the friction away from eating veg yeah. vegetables. Right. But how do you have something that triggers your triggers you to cook in the kitchen that's a monthly not like every single day not this this day that you're giving up your free day yeah right? like suddenly giving up a weekend day exactly it's a lot it's a lot so and does it have to be martha stewart culinary amazingness no like simple food right simple preparation roasted veggies where you can put it in leave it come back in 30 minutes and you have some beautiful vegetables with olive oil and salt and some seasoning or something even just olive oil and salt salt it doesn't have to be I think we we get worked up that it needs to be we need to follow recipes and it needs to be a really, you know, decadent, beautiful meal for everyone to be excited about it. No, it just needs to be simple. So can you get a meat thermometer and learn how to cook meat based on it can be at any temperature in your oven. You put a meat thermometer in and you'll know based on the type of meat when it's done. Yeah. Right. That like. Learning those little tricks so you don't have to rely on recipes. But when I when I talk about outside triggers, it's like an automated box from Thrive Market. I've saw, I've saved twelve hundred dollars with Thrive Market this year on healthy food that I buy my family. Wow! And so you know, every eight weeks I get a box. Every four weeks I get a box based on what my family consumes. So I'm starting to run my home a little bit like my business. It's like I have our pantry goods arriving, so I'm not going. Well, what can I make for dinner? What I know the simple things. And yeah, we eat a lot of the same things over and over and over again, <laughs> protein and veggies, taco night. But they, when the, those things arrive, they're there and I use them. And the same with like a butcher box or a Thrive Market delivery or a force of nature. Like if you have proteins delivered to your house and your freezer only has so much space, you're either going to get a box and go like, oh no, I need to give this to neighbors mm. or you got to get cooking, right? And yeah. so you sort of get in the habit of doing it based on the fact that it's coming into your life and you have to work through it. Yeah. I love that. I used to get, uh, I used to, there was a period where I was getting just, I had like a surplus yeah. of frozen meat and my neighbors loved me because I was always giving them like the highest quality <laughs> butcher box or, you know, like Belcampo rest in peace, I know. <laughs> uh, rest in peace meat. And, um, and yeah, it's like, that's a great way to, you know, like bond with, with the people around you too, like to offload some of that stuff. Right. I think it just, we just get really excited about the new year. And I mean, from a, whether it's the first of the month, a Monday or a brand new year, which is like the most exciting, right? Because it's all this buildup of like, ugh, you just got through the holidays and you kind of pushed, kicked the can and pushed it off and pushed it off. Now there's all this pressure to make major change. And I think you can have, you know, so business entrepreneurs don't do their five-year plan in a year, right? right. Like they might, outpace some of their goals and be really excited about growth because things are moving, but you have to look at your life that way too. So let's say we took inventory of your life and we said, okay, you want to dial sleep. We want to dial exercise. You want to dial food. Then we have to layer on top of that. Okay. What's your sleep 
hygiene right now? What's your food right now? And what's your exercise right now? Because instead of going from zero to 60, we want you to get good at something, feel good about it. I know you picked up boxing and it was like fun and then you loved it, right? Yeah. So that's the kind of thing. It's like, it, it's not, you're not pushing yourself to go box. You're feeling called to box. You're, you're feeling the benefits. You're seeing the benefits. The same with meditation. It isn't, you're going to push a little bit, but set up your space to make it easy and then set little goals. I'm not going to box every day. I'd like to, I'd like to sign up for boxing twice a week. Hmm. And then you start getting that itch of like, I have to go boxing. Yeah. And that's a way better place and space to be in when you're feeling called to do something. It's so true. And it's actually, you know, when I started meditating, I, um, and I've just been doing this for like three weeks at this point. So, Own it. but it's yeah, a, but it's I'm, a thing for you. I'm, I'm continuing to do it cause I am seeing benefits. But when I started, I was like, okay, this is kind of a new thing for me. And I really want it to be sustainable. Am I going to try to go all out for the recommended 20 minutes? No, I, I started with 10 minutes. There you go. And I was like, if I could, you know, 10 minutes, it's the way that I, I've talked about workouts, like even a shitty workout, even a, even a 20 minute workout is better than no workout. So I was like, has to be the same for meditation, right? So I'm just going to do a 10 minute meditation and see if I can hang with that, right? So I did 10 minutes. The next day I did another 10 minutes. And I was the, and then, you know, maybe th- it was like three days in a row I did 10 minutes. And I'm like, I'm, I'm digging this. This is working for me. If I can do 10 minutes, I can do 12 minutes. Yeah. I started doing 12 minutes. Then I got up to 15 minutes and now I'm at 20 minutes, which is sort of like the goal. You know, it's yeah. like the, in TM, like I think 20 minutes is like the recommended dose of meditation. And you got there naturally. You, 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 you felt motivated to do it intrinsically. And that's, I think, where we, when it's coming from the outside and the outside world said, Max, you need to med- meditate for 20 minutes. And you started that first day, might've gone great. You might've been like, all right, here's my to-do list and all the other things I could be doing with this time. Or you, you leaned in, you know, you, you had your 10 minutes and then you worked your way up. And so that's, I'm constantly the break with a lot of my clients because I want to see this last. It needs to be a lifestyle. And sometimes we, you know, a habit will be a habit for a certain amount of time and then it goes away. And we, but if it's sustainable and say you meditate for three to six months and then you don't meditate for three months, you'll think about it in the back of your mind and you'll know that it's accessible to you and that it's a habit that you can go back to. And there's going to be a time when you're maybe writing another book or feeling a little bit stressed out or going through something traumatic and going, I need meditation. That helped centered me. It helped me, you know, feel like I could handle it. So um, I love that. I, I love getting, I love when clients find something that works for them. It's like that saying like the best workout is the one you do, or it, it's true. Like you have to find the things that are working for you. So take an inventory of your life, look at all the ways that you could improve your health and then find ways to set up your space or have external things become the trigger for you. And so with a workout, that might be that you get a coach or a trainer or a friend that signs on with you for a certain amount of time to hold you accountable. That community really is, I mean, we're tribal beings and that community can not only feel amazing to connect with your friends and or a coach or someone that's pushing you, um, but those people can help you get over that pull period where you're pulling yourself to go do something. And then it's fun. Absolutely. What about speaking of time, finding the time? You know, a lot of people have kids, <laughs> uh, which, you know, I can't relate to yet, but a lot of a lot of people have kids that are, you know, th- that's a big time suck from what I'm told. <laughs> uh, nine to five jobs and things like that. So what about creating time? I think block schedules are everything. I never used them before. I had children, to be honest with you. And they're looking back, you know, I always made time to work out because I loved it, you know, and I love to cook. Um, But I look back and I go, okay, I was doing my business, but I'm doing just as much business today as a full-time mom who gets, you know, three plus hours with her children a day and something that I really prioritize. Um, So I don't know where the time went when I look back to pre-kids. It was you know, sucked up by things I might've been passionate about. I might've wasted some time. So blocking your schedule can really help. Like for, for me, podcasts, they're Wednesdays. Like I may tape three, I may tape four and I am set up to do that. Like I'm preparing for those interviews on Tuesday, you know, Monday and Tuesday are really like my days for my business. And then Wednesdays I do podcasts and then Thursday and Fridays are kind of like, Hey, I'm talking to a company. I'm advising, I'm catching up with someone, a colleague, 
I'm seeing a client. Um, so the way that you block your calendar and stick to those and have boundaries around around those block times is really important. We can constantly be pulled in different directions with our time. Someone might say, oh, I only have Friday to tape that podcast. And then I have to say, does that make sense? Do I really want this person? Does it make sense that I take this interview outside of that block schedule? But a lot of times they'll say, you know, I can do a Wednesday, but it's going to be like two months from now. Mm. I'm gonna say, That's okay. Mm. Whereas before I would have moved my schedule around to make it work. It's just better for me mentally to be prepared to roll into that day and tape back to back or to roll into a client day and be in that headspace of reviewing their blood tests and building plans or whatever it may be. Yeah. So planning, planning plays a big, a big role. Yeah. And I think having some, like the more busy that you are having those scheduled times for when you're going to work out, you know, when you're going to meditate, it's right when you roll out of bed, right after you pee, before you go downstairs, yeah. so, like that's scheduled, whether it's on your calendar or not, you've created that time block. And so it's there and it becomes easier. That habit becomes more automatic. And so the goal with habits is that they become automatic and you have this, a bigger why. Like you have to have a bigger why. I mean, yes, the New Year's rolls around. Everyone's been through the pandemic. They've were the most unhealthy we've ever been as a nation. Mm. Like it, it we are spending a whole bunch on supplements and quick fixes, but we have to get back to the basics. And to get back to the basics, you have to have habits around around these behaviors that really make big change. Absolutely. What about nutrition? What are some big mistakes that people make when trying to adopt a healthier dietary pattern? Well, I think what's interesting is a lot of times things are research backed. Like we have the Human Microbiome Project, which is pumping out a lot of research around vegetables and fiber. And then there's some research around intermittent fasting. And there's things even where they show, you know, benefits with OMAD, like one meal a day. Mm. And we, we take it to the nth degree. I think that's a big that's a big problem in the nutrition space. Um, just because having some fermented foods in your life is really good for your microbiome and increases butyrate and is great for your epithelial lining, like great, but doesn't mean that you only need to eat vegetables. Yeah, you know. And I think we maybe have talked about this offline, maybe online, but let's not make our nutrition our religion. Right? There you it's, go. I um, love that. It we have to be flexible to what works for us all the time, and um, so in the nutrition space. I always say if it if it makes sense to add it, add it. But we don't need to I'm more about adding to your life and nourishing than I am about thinking that one way of eating is the only way. Um and so I do see clients get really excited about really strict diets that aren't sustainable for them long term. Um there's nothing wrong with a cleanse or or pulling out some inflammatory foods and taking a, a break for 21 days to six weeks. You know, I've seen benefit of, in, of that clinically, whether it's someone with SIBO who needs to do a FODMAPS diet or hormonal issues, insulin resistance. There are definitely things, dietary things that can decrease inflammation, improve the gut microbiome. But let's not jump on the train of this way is the only way because then you're never, that's confirmation bias. You're never asking yourself, does this still work for me? So when it comes to nutrition, I mean, the one thing that I always love is looking at someone's blood tests. Like, let's get a NutraVal. Let's see. What's your amino acid profile look like? What's your fatty acid profile look like? Where are your B vitamins, your fatty, um, your, um, your fat soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K? Where are those levels? Okay. What kind of foods can you be eating to support optimizing those levels. Mm. So data is always really important to me. And then I love blood sugar. You know that I've been banging my little blood sugar drum for a decade. Yeah, you have. It's finally cool because of CGMs. <laughs> Are you still wearing one? Because I know that you, yeah. you oh, wow. It's on, it's on the back awesome. of my arm right now. So um, yeah, I mean, I love levels. I'm a huge fan. They're making that tech available to people. But what that does is that allows people to understand why they could have Maybe they could get away with some rice and their blood sugar is still balanced because they're super active. Instead of letting the world tell them it's horrible for them, mm. what works for you? So health tech, I think, is really supportive of people making resolutions and sticking to them because that feedback. Yeah. Do you track your sleep as well? Uh, yeah, I'm not wearing my Aura Ring. It's actually charging right now. Oh, cool. um, but I love my Aura Ring. I just upgraded like, you know, the version three that came out. Yeah. I was like, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. But the Aura Ring is what gets me in bed around 9.30. Otherwise, I can sometimes be like up till 10.30, 11, 12, 1, if I get real, you know, 
really excited about a rabbit hole, I may be down it and that's dangerous. So the the aura ring has shown me time and time again, like if I get in bed by 930 and I'm sleeping by 10, which is really hard because you put your kids down and you're like, oh my God, I have an hour or two to myself. Um, I can see time and time again, I get twice the REM sleep, twice the deep sleep. And I feel like a totally different person. Wow. I was having a, actually, so I don't, I don't regularly wear any, any kind of tra- like tracking device, but I do, I do have an aura ring, um, somewhere that I, <laughs> that I want to find. And I was, I was having a conversation last night. So recently, another thing that I've started doing, uh, another habit that I've, that I've started stacking, I, um, I mouth tape at night when I go to sleep, which I, I find to be amazing. It's, it's so great. First of all, I discovered, so I use an app sometimes called sleep cycle to wake me up, which is a great app. It wakes you up. It lists, it, it's like, a, it's, it uses your phone, micro, your phone's microphone. You put it by your bed and it listens to determine when you are in your lightest phase of sleep. REM sleep during REM sleep, which is very deep, uh, stage of sleep. Your body is basically paralyzed below the neck. And so it listens to make sure that there's movement. And so within a half an hour window of when you want to wake up, it wakes you up when it hears movement. So, and it, and it also tracks your sleep and it also records any noises that are made temporarily. It's like sounds. So, you know, I'm not a snorer, but like occasionally maybe I come to my house. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Chris is a major snorer. He's a major snorer. Yeah. So I, I, I don't like chronically snore, but you know, if I do snore like once or twice, it has recorded it. And all I needed to do was hear myself snore. Yeah. And I was like, I'm fucking taping <laughs> yeah. my, I do not, I'm not snore. I'm not yeah. a snore. Yeah. Um, so I've started, uh, mouth taping. And also of course we know how important nose breathing is yada, yada, yada. Uh, so over the past couple of weeks, I've been religiously mouth taping before I go to sleep. I buy these like these, you know, I, I spend, it's like 10 bucks on Amazon. I get like 120 of these like strips. You just put it like on your lips and it keeps your, keeps your mouth closed when you're sleeping. So anyway, I was having this conversation last night with somebody who said that he, he was just, you know, offering his own anecdote uh, to the conversation that we were having. And he said that he, you know, he has an aura ring and before he was mouth taping, his heart rate, his overnight heart rate was at a certain number. I forget what the number was, but he saw that number plummet when he started mouth taping. Wow. Yeah. That, that n- nose breathing caused a, a significant drop in his, his, in his overnight heart rate, which is obviously great. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. So I want to run that experiment on myself and see if I exp- Let's find that aura experience ring. the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was like going to look for it today and charge it up and, and yeah, try to get to it. Yeah. I mean, it's those types of insights, right? Which get you excited. Like you're having a conversation at dinner and now all of a sudden you're excited to check, track your own sleep, knowing that you feel better mouth taping and all the benefits that have been documented. But now like, let's do a study N of one, Yeah, you know, because it's really about your life. Like what's going to give you the most energy? What's going to get you the most excited uh, about working out or cooking healthy or, you know, getting consistent around something. So, um, Yeah. And I also think we need to simplify, like just be minimalist in our life so that we are making the space and the time to get creative. We are creative beings. I know a lot of people, well, some people will say that they're not creative and they don't have a creative bone in their body, but I think that they just haven't given themselves the space to be creative and have an outlet. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And I think there's creativity exists in different contexts, right? Like we as a culture have decided that creativity means I'm able to paint or make music or whatever the, you know, whatever the medium happens to be. But, you know, my brother is a software engineer. I'm sure he's very creative with his programming. Totally. I'm sure there are people who are creative wizards in Excel, (laughs) you know, like my assistant Sydney has been very creative with my schedule over the past couple of months. So yeah, creativity is like a totally, uh, you know, it's, it's totally context, you know, it's a very context, uh, dependent concept. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, what about, I mean, like in nutri in the online wellness world, you see a lot of like black or white thinking, you know, like unless your diet is fully gluten-free or fully, you know, vegan or paleo or carnivore, you're not doing it right. How do people get past that sort of like, you know, mindset toxicity? Well, that's where I go back to blood sugar. Um, and that's where I go back to looking at maybe a NutriVal where I can see someone's nutrient levels personally. Um, I think people get really excited and dogmatic about something that's worked for them. Like 
someone who's dogmatic about being vegan or someone who's dogmatic about being carnivore might have had a personal experience that really was transcendent transcendent for them. Like yeah. they just they heal, they they got rid of um, you know, depression or they they felt their best, they looked their best, whatever it was that was that positive reinforcement for them to do that diet, um, then they're gonna go around and be a prophet for it yeah. and preach. Exactly. Right. And and that's okay. I, I think what we need to do, though, is be open-minded of other people's opinions. Um, and I think that that is actually a really big problem in, in this world in general right now. It is um, it is this black and white thinking is this is right and this is wrong, my way or the highway. And unfortunately, it it, it shuts us off from learning and mm. being open to learning. We have these confirmation biases and we're constantly looking for ways to like prove our opinion. Um and we just get stuck. And the problem with that is then we're not open to understanding if it's working for us long term. Like I have had clients who have, you know, unfortunately seen like a decrease in choline levels, vitamin D levels, B vitamin levels, and they've loved a specific diet for a really long time. And it may be totally deficient in those nutrients that they need, but they've talked about it to their friends for so long and they identify so deeply with that diet that they aren't actually even taking a minute to say, like, this isn't working for me. Yeah. Maybe they've seen dangerous. like a, a celebrity or somebody like on a vegan diet seemingly thriving and they say to themselves, well, she's doing it. It's working for her. It's right. got to work for me. Right. And I, that's where I always go back to the data. And that's where I think health tech can be really supportive. I mean, I have vegan and vegetarian clients on CGMs. I have carnivore leaning clients on CGMs. I have intermittent fasting clients on CGMs. Wow. Like it's, it, that tech allows me to understand, hey, like you haven't eaten anything, but you had a major surge in blood sugar at this period point in time in the day. You weren't working out, you weren't over caffeinating. What was going on here? And what's coming to the surface for a lot of my clients is that they're like biochemistry is fully being affected by their mood and their stress levels. Mm. And we know that when we're feeling stress, we have a surge of adrenaline, we have a surge of cortisol, and that impacts our blood sugar. That's going to impact our energy, our mood, our cravings, our ability to concentrate. It has a major impact. So whether it's the food that they're getting insight on or how just how they interact with the world, how that's impacting their like internal state, it's really priceless. Yeah. What about mindset? I mean, we, we're obviously, you know, I think heading in this direction, but a lot of people will attempt to change their behavior without addressing the core values underlying that behavior. You know, so they'll try, they'll make like the, they'll sign up for a gym, right? And everybody knows that these gyms are, that gyms are flooded in January, right? Yeah. With the, with the new signups, but that those people that haven't really changed the mindset, um, that they that it's not it's not a sustainable activity for them that they just drop off. Right. So what's like what are some mindset hacks that people can use? Well, you mentioned that you started going to therapy and then you started meditating. Um talking about like trends and thinking about mindset, we need to address the fact that we've come out of a pandemic, you know, and we have the highest rates of teenage suicide attempts. We have the highest rates of depression and anxiety and we're just going to throw a, a workout routine on top of that that we're now going to be stressed out about and then feel bad when it fails. Like that's going to make us feel better, right? right? No, it's not. So much pressure that we right. put on ourselves. It's a lot of pressure. And so what I love is a focus on mental health. I think you see places like OK Human, which is like the dry bar of therapy that just opened in L.A., where you can just roll right in. And it has cute little menu and you say, I would like the 45 minute like decompress or whatever. I don't know mm. what the menu titles are, but it we're getting rid of the stigma around mental health. I think, you know, you see things like trauma release therapy and psychedelics and all of these ways, these modalities to address underlying issues and traumas that affect our behavior. Mm. Like if you grew up and you had a major trauma or a chronic minor trauma that happened in your childhood and your behavior is a certain way because of it, it's really hard to just mandate yourself or like tell yourself, I'm going to go work out and I'm going to change my mindset. Like we have to 
just like in functional medicine, we have to use holistic psychiatry to get to the root of the issue and start to heal because that's when we'll feel motivated to really get out there and go to the gym because we feel like it. Or maybe we're not going to stress eat or late night eat because we were doing that as a band-aid of these feelings of pain that we had in our from our childhood or from a breakup or from a mean boss. I don't know what it is. Yeah. You know, it's everyone has their own story. But I love that we're talking about mental health, that we're destigmatizing, getting help for it, and that people are healing because however they decide to heal or treat that, um, it's going to make them show up for the world, for themselves first in a totally different way and create a better place for all of us to be a part of. You know, we all have, we all have the responsibility to work on ourselves first. Absolutely. And the me- I'm so glad you brought up mental health. It's such a big, it's, it's such, such an important topic, especially today. Uh, you know, people are drinking more alcohol than, you know, al- alcohol sales are up. Um, so this is, yeah, it's definitely an important topic. For sure. Um, yeah. I, the therapy thing has been really, really great for me. I mean, I, you know, it's like, I've, I've never really had any mental health, like, challenges or anything like that. I think I've just experienced what the normal ebb and flow of human emotion. Um, but it's always great to have somebody who you're able to, uh, I could, sometimes I use this metaphor. It's like your sock drawer, you know, it's like, it's really hard to organize a sock drawer (laughs) or your underwear drawer without taking everything out first to like, you know, set everything right, like on the bed and then put it back in the drawer, <laughs> yeah. you know? And so I think I, I, I kind of see like having a therapist as being the person that you like take out the socks and the underwear and like set, you know, like lay it all out before attempting to like refold it and put it back in, like in a more, in a more organized fashion. And I think that that's, that responsibility is just too much for like a friend or a family member to, to burden them with. So, and there are also like a number of apps now that are available that make it like really easy and accessible. Um, Because there was a time when I couldn't afford a therapist. Right. Um, And I, and I, you know, because I had been curious about seeing one for a long time before I actually pulled the trigger and started seeing one um, on a a regular basis. But, um, but now there are like, you know, a bunch of different tools out there that are, that are, yeah, lowering the bar, which is great. Well, I think you said something that's really important. Like you, you don't want to burden your friends or your family members with that, with whatever it is that you're dealing with. And I think that's something that I worry about for my kids. Like everyone's online and they're on social and it's surface level conversations, but the biggest gift you can give someone is just a non-judgmental ear, like someone who can truly listen and work things out with you. Um, But it is, it is, everyone needs that. And Therapists are just really good at it. Yeah. <laughs> they're really, they're, they were educated to know how to do it, to support someone through their own thought process, to evoke things from people. So they're able to, like you said, it's almost like you're purging everything out onto your bed and then going like, okay, what's the most important things? How am I going to put those in the front of the front of the drawer? Yeah. How am I going to like reprioritize what's important to me and, and like have a clear picture on my life? And most of the CEOs, actors, and like really successful people that I work with, they might call it a business coach. They might call it a mentor. They might call it a therapist. Um, but they have someone that they are bouncing ideas off of, working things through with, strategically having a plan about their life. Um, and so that's that's what I love about it is let's destigmatize it. Let's get people into seeing like whether it's a therapist or a counselor to support them. Um, because we all need to be listened to and we all need to kind of speak out loud to understand what our thoughts are sometimes. Yeah. I find, and I, I made this, uh, this observation actually yesterday, um, when I was with my therapist that one of the things that I particularly like about her is that she is a teacher and it made me realize that like when you see a doctor, the word doctor actually originates from the word teacher and but it's not, you know, this is not a quality that is exclusive to to doctors, right? I mean, I think like the best life coaches, the best nutritionists, they are teachers. They're giving you the tools so that you can be, you know, be better informed so that you can ultimately start to make these decisions on your own. Mm-hmm. 
which is, I think, why, I mean, I, I love your work so much because that's what you are for your followers and for your clients. Well, I just, I can give you a PDF of what you should eat and not eat, sure, every day, but that's not, that's not going to create the action and the sustainability that I would love for my clients. So yeah, we get, I'm a little bit annoying. We get into the de <laughs> details on blood sugar and nutrient status and all kinds of stuff like that, but I'd rather teach them to fish. Yeah. So, so. <laughs> it's, it's so important. Um, what about hydration? Does that play a, a role in, in the recommendations that should, you make? Cause I find should, a lot of people. Should I just go up, get up and get my water bottle that's loaded yeah, with you, element? <laughs> you brought like, you brought like, it's like a gallon jug. Is there element in there? Yeah. We love element. Shout out to element. Yay, one of our, one thanks of our, Rob Wolf. One of our sponsors. Yeah. <laughs> I drink about a packet a day at yeah. this point. I'm uh, sometimes at two, but I'm breastfeeding still. So it's um, really dehydrating to breastfeed. <laughs> Is yeah. it? Wow. Yeah. You, it, you all, it also increases your calorie need, right? Uh, it does. It's um, it's fun. I can out eat Chris right now. Wow. <laughs> yeah, no. I, I mean, I really, I really focus on nutrient density at this point in my life. Like I love prenatal nutrition. I love pregnancy nutrition. I love postpartum nutrition. I love kids nutrition, but it's all like those periods of life. It's kind of like you're an athlete. Like you have to be focused on nutrient density. You have to be focused on hydration. You have to be focused on sleep as much as you can when you have kids yeah, <laughs> or when you're, um, you know, a new mom. But yeah, I mean, that's been a major game changer for me. And I actually have a few dietitians that I work with, um, and have mentored that, kind of live a low carbohydrate, slightly like metabolically flexible, maybe they're dipping into ketosis sometimes type of a, a lifestyle. And I have received the most amazing like texts and phone calls. I mean, the reviews are insane. Like even people that I respect and refer clients to are like, Kelly, this stuff is game changing because it, feeling fully hydrated and having the, that mineral support is amazing for your brain. Like you can focus and you can have a conversation and, and it's, I think, great for killing cravings too. So it's a major, it's a major player for me. And probably one of those things that has come in in the last year and a half that is now a, a daily recommendation. Yeah. After I sauna, I, I've actually done this end of one test in on myself. If I just drink water after uh, sauna. And I, when I sauna, I sauna pretty hard. Like I go, you know, I have access to a Russian banya in LA, which is a very high, it gets up to like 210 degrees. <laughs> it's extremely hot, drenched afterwards. But if I'm, if I'm just drinking water to replenish fluids after that type of saunaing, uh, I feel drained afterwards. Totally. Whereas when I drink element, um, and I have that packet of element, uh, in my water and I'm sipping that, I feel completely energized. So it's like, that's, it's, it's, you know, element makes me feel energized. Whereas not replacing the electrolytes lost, I feel just depleted. Right. Well, super interesting is when we look at blood sugar, when someone has a really strenuous workout or when they sauna, a lot of times blood sugar will go up adrenaline and cortisol. It's a stress on the body. Your liver is, you know, releasing stored sugars and dumping it into your bloodstream so you have a little bit of energy, but you're also losing a lot of water. You're getting dehydrated. So yeah. then you're talking about, it's almost like taking balsamic vinegar and making like a reduction. Like <laughs> your, your blood volume is going down. And so the quantity of sugar in your blood is actually, you know, it's more. And so when you're properly hydrated, um, so whenever I'm working out and whenever I'm sauning, if I'm using Element, people say you see massive spikes in blood sugar, I actually can watch my blood sugar stay elongated and flat. Wow. So just from drinking more fluids with electrolytes, with yeah. electrolytes, with element. Yeah. So key point for element, um, is that they don't add sugar. So a lot of the electrolytes on the market that you'll see, whether that's a Costco or CVS or Walgreens or whatever, a lot of them are adding sugar, mm. right? They're adding they add sugar element is one of the only sugar-free electrolytes out there. And so I love that because a lot of us are getting enough carbohydrates and sugar oh, yeah. in our daily life. But, um, but I thought that was amazing because I know not only is my blood volume staying at like the level it needs to be, but, um, I don't have that dehydrated, lightheaded, I need to eat feeling. Um, and I never used to have that prior to, I was pretty used to fasted workouts, um, prior to kids and even a little bit in my first pregnancy. 
Um, but throughout my second pregnancy and breastfeeding, like I need to have electrolytes or, and some food and, but I feel amazing on this stuff. I, I'm it's never, not in here. It's over there. I gotta go grab there. it later. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. But you're, you're you're essentially making a balsamic vinegar reduction in your blood. You're you're concentrating the sugar that's in your blood when you sweat vigorously. If you're not replenishing fluids and electrolytes mm -hmm. afterwards, yeah, that's kind of scary. Just I mean, to it's, think about. It's that's a, a very, pretty drastic example, yeah. but yeah, that's technically when we are properly hydrating throughout our workouts or throughout our sauna, like I will take element into the sauna with me. I'm sipping it. I'm reading a book most of the time. And that's, that's for me. Yeah. That's awesome. I, uh, I definitely relate and agree and love element. Um, do you have a set goal for yourself in terms of like, you know, there's like this, uh, myth that's been floating around for some time now that you need eight glasses of water a day. <laughs> yeah. If you're not drinking eight glasses of water a day, you're doing it wrong. And you know, I always, uh, but that's a myth. No. Yeah. I think, um, I think you have to love Chris Cresser. I think he busted that myth like six or seven years ago. I was like, no, <laughs> there's no, there's no research behind that. I, I think if we're properly hydrating with electrolytes, drinking to thirst is important. If you're feeling thirsty though, I think you need to get in the habit of drinking more water. Yeah. Um, what I have seen though is clients who don't drink water all day and then they sit down to 40 ounces and then their pee is clear, Yeah. <laughs> you know? So, uh, a light yellow is what we're going for unless you're taking supplements and then you're dropping a highlighter in your toilet. Right. Well, that's super interesting because I think that, uh, many people think that your pee should be clear and that clear pee is a sign of optimal hydration, but you could actually be overhydrating. Absolutely. And think about every single time that you're filtering your blood and peeing peeing you're releasing electrolytes you're peeing out the electrolytes that your body needs to have neurological function mm. so um we can be overhydrated and and i think that that's a problem so by adding adding in electrolytes or just being in touch with like how often are you drinking water it's also important not to overhydrate when you're eating because you have hydrochloric acid and you have enzymes that are doing the work of digestion. Those are your digestive ju digestive juices, and they do the job of. I use the example. My analogy is the brick brick wall analogy, something like that. Mm -hmm. you, you drop your food into your stomach. It's like a brick wall. Your enzymes and hydrochloric acid they're going to dissolve all the mortar, and you're going to absorb your nutrients brick by brick. But when you're flooding your system with water, you're not going to get that proper digestion and then you're not going to get the absorption you're gonna get more fermentation in the gut you're gonna have more bloating you're gonna have um slower uh bowel movements like less often so sometimes with clients it's talking about when they're drinking water mm. and how they're drinking water so i love water out outside of meals with some electrolytes i think it's a great way to to actually know whether you are hungry so a lot of times people feel hunger pains, they may be thirsty. We add a little electrolytes, that salt and the water, they feel good. And then they can, they can maintain their fast. So the element is like the, the, your salt lamp. Like it's a tool for me with clients who want to shrink their feeding window. We're not being aggressive about it, but Hey, like if you're up at 515, cause your child's up at 515 and you can wait to have breakfast till seven or eight, what helps you get there? Is it a cup of coffee or is it some electrolytes and water or is it both? Let's find the tools to support you to get to your goals without just saying, just do it. Yeah. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> you know? It's so great. It is interesting the degree to which uh, electrolyte, um, our, need, our needs for electrolytes and other minerals can influence our hunger. I was having this conversation with a, a friend recently and he was telling me that he... By adding salt to his food, he actually, it makes him eat less. Yeah. Well, there's a satiety piece there, but I also, you know, I, I just, I don't know. I think it's really interesting that um, salt has been so demonized. And especially as people lean into a lower carbohydrate or ketogenic style diet, however, whatever they want to call it. Yeah. You know, they're not identifying with a diet great. They maybe just are slightly pescatarian, but they just eat protein and veggies. You actually, without eating the processed foods, you aren't getting the majority of the sodium that people get in an American diet. Yeah, so right. when we look at the research and we see that everyone, that they're demonizing salt for hypertension and um, 
issues like that, it's disheartening for me because when someone goes on a whole food diet, I want them salting their food. Mm. I want them feeling satisfied by their food. I want those minerals because they're excreting more. Yeah, absolutely. It's only, I mean, this is kind of a shocking statistic, but it's only about 11, 11% of the sodium that your average American ingests comes from the salt that they put on their own food or that they use to, to cook their own food at home. The vast majority of sodium that your average American ingests comes, comes from fast food, restaurant food, packaged processed foods. So if you cut that out, you're actually not ingesting a ton of sodium. Mm -mm. And then it becomes, it it actually, I mean, this is kind of mind blowing to consider sodium as such in the context of Western life, but it, it can become a nutrient of concern. Yeah. Which absolutely. is amazing. I mean, it's a, it's a macro mineral, right? Like people need to ingest for good health, a relatively high amount of sodium. It's not one of these trace minerals like zinc, right? No, it's, um, and they're looking, when they look at the data, it's up to five grams and you know, the government is recommending less than half of that. Yeah, it's crazy. So, The other thing about uh, people restricting their salt is that they, they, start, they or, or making the shift towards, you know, more naturally produced salts is that they don't get as much, they're not, you know, iodine becomes another nutrient where people um, can become insufficient in. Right. Yeah, which is a problem. We need iodine for good thyroid health. Yeah, and you look at and well, it's it's interesting too. You look at these minerals. You have you have iodine, you have zinc, you have selenium. Like we are becoming mineral deficient, mm. and trace minerals and macro minerals super important to have in your diet. When you eat a whole food diet, when you eat an animal rich diet, you're getting a lot of those minerals. Yeah, whether that's seafood or or red meat, uh, some of the things that have been demonized, whether it's oysters and shrimp or for cholesterol or it's red meat like that's where the good stuff is yeah <laughs> you work with a lot of female clients so would you say your roster is like predominantly female at mm -hmm. this point what are some of the like are there any gender specific um mistakes that you find that tend to come up a lot like you know at least from my vantage point i see a lot of women women are often and this is not always the case right of course but uh many are are um hesitant to uh go all in on animal products they think that eating a steak is not cute or you know the organ meats freak them out i think i i can eat a cute steak or, <laughs> yeah <laughs> no i agree there's no. a, to me there's like nothing no, I sexier think, i think eating red meat is cute come on yeah um, no I, I agree yeah no i do have clients who um but it's just old science it's 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 breaking down these myths and these old beliefs, whether it be cholesterol or salt or red meat. When someone tries to get healthy, they'll jump on the internet and they'll Google it for a diet or their favorite influencer who has a rock and bod doesn't do X, Y, and Z. Mm. So they're not going to do it. Or they'll watch, they'll watch a documentary on Netflix. <laughs> yeah. So name, and those are unfortunately the real science backed research isn't always coming to them in a super digestible, easy to understand way that they can then implement in their life. So I find it my personal responsibility to support people like Rob Wolf who are, you know, destigmatizing eating red meat as a female. And um, I don't know, it's, it's hard, especially when I look at fertility data, when I look at egg health data and pregnancy nutrient needs. I mean, we did a podcast on it. Like, mm. It's red meat can be a superfood, and I do have clients who feel like they don't want to eat it. And so it's my job to educate, whether that be I'm educating you on the benefits of leafy greens or I'm educating you on the benefits of red meat. I'm constantly trying to break their beliefs when it comes to saying that something shouldn't be on their plate. Yeah, I love that. Prenatal nutrition, postnatal nutrition, these are topics that you're obviously very passionate about. Yeah, well, it became – when I got pregnant and when I was getting pregnant, trying to get pregnant, when I was pregnant, postpartum, it, it, that's what I was excited about. Like mm. I wanted to set my, I want to set my kids up for success. What I'm loving right now, and I think a trend that'll come um, next year is actually male fertility because you're responsible for 50% of the genetics here. Hey, hey. <laughs> um, yeah. And it's not a topic that people talk about male fertility. No, and it's well, and unfortunately when they're when 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 families are having trouble conceiving, the blame tends to fall solely on the on the on the female. It's our fault. It's yeah. such a problem. 
It's a huge problem. Yeah. It's a huge problem. And normalize talking about male fertility. Right. It, we need to. And so you look at nutrients, um, like I just mentioned selenium. Selenium is critical for men. You know, it supports um, you know, your body against heavy metals and heavy metals are oxidative. They're a stress on the body. And so you need minerals like selenium to fight that fight against heavy metals so that you're protecting the DNA of your sperm. We we're thinking about when we, when we look at sperm health, it's morphology, it's mobility. It's like, what does your sperm look like? Can it swim fast towards the egg? And oxidative stress is going to decrease that. That's going to be endocrine disrupting chemicals. That's going to be pestic things like pesticides. That's going to be, you know, a cell phone in your pocket, mm. front pocket of your jeans. That's Guilty. Where, yeah. Like, oh, no. Things like that. Um, but those stressors are going to have an impact on sperm quality. And so we need to look at what is important for men. And there's actually been some studies going on um, on male fertility and sperm quality, you can actually get your sperm quality tested now with a company called Legacy. Wow. So you could, you know, make a sample. I'd be curious to know about mine. <laughs> yeah. I, I feel like quality. most guys would be like, I'd make a sample. Yeah. <laughs> make a sample. <laughs> make a sample and then send it to Legacy and see what's going on with your sperm. Because what we can see, what we find is that by supplementing with antioxidants like CoQ10, by making sure that you have B vitamins um, for you know, detox, cellular detoxification, for example, and, um, and that you have things like selenium, all of that is improving sp your sperm quality. And so, especially as we get pregnant later, have kids later, um, you've just been living your life, becoming in more and more contact with all of the oxidative stress that's out in the world, whether it's smog or personal stress, food quality, chemical toxicity, poor water, bad air, whatever it is, like, Fear monger, fear monger, fear monger. <laughs> um, all of that is going to impact your sperm quality. So I just like to inform my clients, hey, look, like, let's look at fertility and be strategic. You don't have to have children at 25 to have, uh, you know, not have miscarriages. And yes, is that going to improve the odds of, of healthy DNA being passed down in a healthy pregnancy? It, it will. Um, but that, that might not be everyone's life plan. So Things like Legacy for Men, there's a company called Modern for Women where they can get an idea of their egg quality. Then they can make a informed decision, hey, I'd like to freeze my eggs and have some insurance instead of being worried about it, you know, building their career and having their life and having the fun that they want to have or whatever it is. And then starting to date and feeling the pressure of like, well, I need to know if this guy is ready to get married and have babies. We don't that's not the way you should go into a relationship if you can avoid it. And I'm so happy to see that many companies and insurance companies are supporting this process. Like there are tech companies that will pay to have your eggs frozen for you. So wow. really cool benefits that companies are offering so that we can make, like get the information, take the supplements to support the quality, make an informed decision. And then if you need to, if you're a female and you'd like to bank, and I, and I believe Legacy Bank sperm too. So there's a way to hold on to your fertility if you need to. Yeah, and there is an interesting risk. I think a lot of men, uh, there's this um, belief that it doesn't matter how old the man is, right? Like that women have this biological clock uh, and they have this certain timeline, right? But it doesn't, that like men can conceive... Uh, up until you know their dying breath, like we're right. we're good to go. But I think that that I think that the science is starting to point to that being a misconception that the risk of, for example, having a child um, with ASD, autism mm -hmm. spectrum disorder, right. is gets gets higher the older the male, and so um, so yeah, I think that the the notion of of sperm banking is uh, it's probably a good idea, right? Like I mean, it would make sense that my sperm would be at its healthiest in its. It, when I when I am in my twenties, right, right, as opposed to when I'm fifty. Well, and you also want to think about how long um, it takes to to fully develop sperm or like an egg follicle, for example, it, or a follicle to create a baby, right? It's it's not it doesn't just take like a week. It's three months for men. It's like over seventy days. So you want to focus. Not only do you want to focus on your runway or your timeline. So like, yeah, if you want to bank some sperm right now, why not? Right. But you also want to think when you're getting ready to have your child and you're 
maybe feeling like I'm I'm healthy, I'm good, I've taken care of myself. Well, think about that trimester zero. Think about the three months prior to conceiving as an important time for you to fight oxidative stress, mm. to really increase your nutrient status, make sure you're getting those minerals, make sure you're getting B vitamins, make sure your fat soluble vitamins are a peak performance, if you will, or at, at their optimal level, because all of that is going to impact the quality of your fertility and your ability to conceive a child and not have DNA issues. Yeah. You know, it's probably not great for sperm quality is our saunas, unfortunately. Great, great for the body, but probably not good for the sperm. I know. Not good for my swimmers. So bang some swimmers. Yeah. Do your sauna. No, I'm just yeah. kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, a, I mean, it's interesting. And I, I, you know, there are really cool companies like We Natal coming out. Um, I've connected with them. I'm now advising for them because looking at the research and I think you're getting involved. I, yeah. Yeah, you, yeah, yeah. Are, have you decided? I haven't decided yet, but I do really, I mean, regardless of what I do, I think that what, you know, what my choice is in terms of like my engagement with them, um, which I may or may not, but I do think that what they're doing is freaking awesome. Yeah. I mean, well, I'm in it right now, right? Okay. With kids. So yeah, share what We Natal is all about. Well, so we natal is a prenatal for men too. So instead of having, you know, I'm dropping the nutrients of concern here, yeah. they, they do the, the work, hard work for the male. So when you think about that trimester zero, a woman should be taking her prenatal three months prior to getting pregnant if she can, and the men should as well. So they send you the men's prenatal and the women's prenatal. It's at functional levels. Chris Kresser and Mark Hyman are both advisors. They reviewed the nutrients um, that went into those supplements as well, and it's paired with the research, the current research on optimal levels for the best quality egg and sperm. So I love it. It's making it super easy. We'll probably go round three. I'm crazy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> At least I have three children. And so Chris will, I'll put Chris on that when that time comes, just because no matter how healthy of a diet you have, um, there's real life that's happening, whether that's, like I said, stress or environmental toxins that can impact your fertility. And, you know, it's such a no novel and brilliant idea. The, the, the idea of a male prenatal. Yeah. So yeah. they call it we natal. We natal. Both. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, it's freaking awesome. Definitely something that I would I would take if yeah. I were in that in that. Well, do you take a phase of life? Do you take a multivitamin now? I don't take a well. I take Athletic Greens, which is a multivitamin, multi multi mineral. Yeah. Um. Beyond that, no, I don't. You know, I don't take like a a pill or anything. Yeah, and I don't. I don't do Athletic Greens personally every day, but I do take it when I feel like you know I'm depleted or if I'm making a protein shake, it's very easy to like sneak into that. Yeah. Um. But. Yeah, I'm definitely not thinking about my fertility, basically, <laughs> at this at this point. You know, if anything, I want to, like, reduce my fertility yeah. <laughs> just to be safe. Yeah. <laughs> so spending lots of time in saunas. Um, You're doing but, a good job. Yeah, but no, I mean, <laughs> but, but definitely if, like, this is something that was, like, if I was in a serious relationship um, and I was in a, a place where if that were to happen, like I would go, th you know, I would, I would want us to go through with it. Totally. Uh, that would be something that I would want to be on for sure. Right. Well, you as a male do have a longer runway than most females. I mean, we have a shorter runway when it comes to our fertility. It is true, but it isn't, it isn't your quality is better w with youth without coming in contact with all this oxidative stress. Yeah. So cool. Well, people should definitely go and check out We Natal and learn more about it. Um, There'll be more companies like it too coming yeah, out because yeah. the research is there. Yeah, it's a totally new category, which is yeah. great, and they're like the the category leader, which is which is awesome to be part of that. Yeah. Um, what's going on with you? What you got coming up? Well, I just signed my book three deal. Oh man, so exciting! Is this like a? Is this, have you announced it yet? Or is no, this like a, I just am in the. Okay, you're in the writing phase. Yeah. Awesome. Yep. Um, so that's exciting because it's about purposeful living. So it's, it's kind of what we were talking about. It's taking inventory of your life and making decisions based on the life that you want. Um, so understanding that I have my own personal mission and purpose, and then I have priorities for me personally, whether that's a priority daily to move my body or to read a book, you know, that's kind of how I think about my New Year's resolutions is what do, if our days are making up our life? then what we do every day is really important. And what we 
block time for and what we make easy, whether that's taking your supplements before your coffee or setting your mat out to do your meditation or having an infrared sauna in your living room instead of furniture. Yeah. <laughs> you pick. Um, but those kinds of decisions, uh, I'm just really interested in that stuff. I, I, I do like fashion, but I'm a little bit anti-fashion. It's very fast and it's hard to keep up with. Um, whereas if you put your time and energy into your health, then I don't know. My dad always said, you could wear a trash bag. It wouldn't matter if you took care of yourself, you mm, know, like yeah. you just, it, that stuff just doesn't matter, you know? And so I really try to be purposeful with the decision making to create a life that makes it easy to have health. And, you know, I could come in, I could have a disease or a chronic thing happen or something bad happened, but I'm trying my best to prevent that um, with the knowledge I have and the research. So I'm uh, super excited about that book. So that's kind of the thematic, yeah. believe it or not, with what we talked about today. Um, and then I'm launching a, I am launching a vegan protein in February. Nice. So Chocho Bean coming soon. Wow. What is it called? Chocho Bean Powder. Is that... That's not the brand. The brand is Be Well by Kelly, right? It's Be Well by Kelly. The chocho bean is like a, you know, people use pea, pea they use hemp, right. they use rice. Chocho bean is grown in um, the Andes. Never it heard of it. Grows via rainfall. There are zero lectins. It's a complete protein. It's not extracted via hexane. Wow. It's taken me six months to find a supplier there that would actually sell to me. <laughs> wow. This is so, so cool. So I'm super excited about it because... Just generally, I want to be able to offer that, but it's important to me that it's not frankenfoods. Like mm. I think we're seeing the plant-based, some of the plant-based things, it's like tech people decide to be health people and they come out with a product. So, and, so bad. And it's a little bit backwards to me. I like that it's a single ingredient, a single source and basically just ground up. So I it's not going to have the dissolvability of like a whey protein or the grass-fed beef isolate that I have currently now, but- it's a little, it's a little grainy, but it's what I would drink if I was vegan. Yeah. So like, can you pop the beans? Like, are they edible? They're like, lupini beans. Oh yeah. Amazing. Yeah. I, I like those. I eat yeah. those sometimes. Yeah. So, um, so super stoked about that. Hey guys, if you enjoyed that conversation, you're going to love this one. First off, let's like set a working definition if we can in your estimation, like what, what is a superfood? Yeah, I mean, shit, it moves around for me too, because, because I think now you can look at it, uh, uh, certainly you can look at a food, but man, the more complexity breeds more inputs and those inputs then obviously play a huge role. So you're like, how super is the soil, right? How super is the harvesting? How super is the drying? Or if that's necessary, or how how soon is someone eating that? Uh, what state are they in while consuming that? What kind of microbiological systems do they have in place while that is really the epicenter of enzymatic upregulating, downregulating? So, so, dude, you know, we could blow apart the whole thing right there in terms of. We already know that the microbiome is so bloody complex. Even, even when you're consuming something, someone who has a healthier microbiome is literally able to extract more nutrients, utilize more nutrients, create more nutrients with the building blocks of those nutrients when their microbiological system is healthier. So you're like, holy shit. So if I'm consuming, let's use a simple blueberry because there's so much going on in a blueberry. Like, let's use that as an example. So it's like they now know that polyphenols, anthocyanins to be specific, are actually a type of fiber mm. benefiting the healthy, good microflora. So, and those are often linked to the color of the blueberry too. So it's like, what this, what, what, what is a complex antioxidant is really yes. And this K2 
connection to the microbiome and this food for the healthy microbiome. So you're like, shit, now the blueberry just catapulted itself into a whole nother category, which is now supporting your mind, supporting your healthy transformational um, alchemical system, which is your microbiome. So, so then, so, so no super is on its own because literally one person eating it and the other person eating next to them, they're literally getting different things. <laughs> like, holy shit. Wow. Based on a variety of things. I mean, you can even look at like, how calm are you? How downregulated and parasympathetic are you while you're eating? Right. That also has massive implications to your ability, adrenaline, cortisol, your ability to upregulate uh, virtually anything. So, 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 so going back to your very simple question in a certain sense is very complex for me in this day and age. Because listen, I think the simple answer was, as I was investigating foods way back in the day, I was literally innocently turning over packages and looking at the marketing as I was also learning about these things academically or starting to actually, for me, I, I would immediately start playing with them. I would start formulating and just, I formulated for a decade with foods first before I even got into supplementation, but it was really the, 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 the source of it all came by way of seeing call it fatal conveniences of, mm -hmm. of supplementation, right? So, so why is that filler in there? Why is that GMO cornstarch in this supplement as a stabilizer? Why is this natural flavor that has slid in there, these proprietary, um, uh, you kind of languaging about, hey, this is our proprietary language. So therefore, we're going to slide underneath all of the regulatory bodies and not have to disclose. Uh, so propylene glycol, all of these other things. So as I was looking into all this stuff and a lot more, I started to go like, okay, their marketing is not lining up with number one, maybe that presentation of how that thing was that that food that supplement that herb that botanical was dried and used so it doesn't even make sense right moringa is a good example of that most moringa mm -hmm. on the market is just dull green brown and yellow which is you know the 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 photonic power uh you can already understand that green leaves that is of moringa leaves you know are heat sensitive and things like that and have nutrients and chlorophylls and even B vitamins in there as well, but vitamin C's 35 other antioxidants. So you can grow it easily, cut it down. And if you don't process it very quickly, wash it, dry it, lock that in, then you're going to have what is in a bottle just as a name with no super left in it. Right. So, 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 so now I'm, I'm going off on a million tangents, but I hope people understand the complexity because superfood on its own. So my innocence was let's start the superfood journey by, I got to show up in this area, in the Amazon, in the Andes, I got to show up to see what the hell is going on. And, and, and innocently, let me talk to the farmer. How are you growing this? What kind of water systems? I remember a very sophisticated water system using, you know, worms and the rebuilding of soils. And this was in 2004 in the middle of the Andes. And they were already doing advanced research uh, with tubers because it's the tuber capital of the world. So I met all these scientists and you walk away going, uh, no one's doing this. Hmm. And it, and if they are, they're trying to produce, at least production wise, trying to take 
in this case, maybe it's Sasha Inchi and it was Yacon and it was Maka and these advanced growing methods uh, on an ancient food. Um, I didn't know that. I didn't read that anywhere, but I didn't, I understood that when I showed up and I understood the difference between that and just any, any old one on the market. So as you can imagine, then how is that soil? How are they processing it? The science and the science team that's validating all of that stuff. And I'm sitting there going, wow, like no one knows this stuff, but yet everyone can market and say anything. So that's what seeded, pun intended, that's what, that's what seeded my desire to put these into supplements, to put these into the world. And also the other super is to support these indigenous people that have now become friends so that they can have a better life. And, and, and then you could tie it in a bow saying, this is the early form of regeneration. This is regeneration is not extracting and leaving less abundant. It is working with nature, not against nature. So, and, and so that if you're looking through the lens of regeneration on every level, it has to benefit the customer with no inputs of chemicals, um, with high phenolic or other types of compounds or whatever, whatever that superfood is. Uh, validated and tested, uh, and then the soil and the farming methods, and then the farmers themselves. So all of that, Max, and a, probably a whole lot more, is <laughs> what I think superfoods are. Wow, such a holistic perspective. I, I mean, I, I so appreciate that. It, it really makes you wonder how far removed modern foods have have come from that. Like just how, 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 how far modern foods have journeyed from their source. I mean, if you think about modern wheat, soy, corn, it's all been bred to hell at this point. But then you take a wild plant, like the kinds of plants that you describe, yakon, maca, those are plants with vigor, right? Like those are plants that are still having to fight for them, for their own survival. Yeah. And then we pluck those plants or we pick them or, or what have you. And we ingest them. And what I love about this is that they impart that vigor unto you. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, listen, I mean, teed up, which is why I fell in love with Baruchas, is because of that very thing. We were able to actually, you know, we talk about maca, yakon, sasha, inchi. Those are now being grown and then grown in careful ways. And many of the superfoods are now be doing that in some sort of farming method and hopefully a diversification of the, that utilization of different plants contributing to the soil buildup rather than the stripping of, whereas that's where I fell in love with Baruchas. This was literally, and still is a wild food. This is in a landmass that's almost half of the United States in its landmass, but we are collecting that which falls at the time that it needs to fall, giving the full nutrients and the strength of the Sahadu, which is nine months, eight to nine months, no rain, and then monsoons. And so the strength and the antioxidants and the compounds that are there for its survival, which the great synergy between us and the plants is that we get to utilize and we get to benefit from these compounds that are protecting the plants, but then they're also weirdly protecting us and we get to use that upregulation. And so that's why Baruchas came this perfect kind of scenario where we could support the people, uh, get a wild food out to people because that wild nutrients into bodies is a really good idea, right? One of the most nutrient dense nuts in the world by us testing them. And then that those indigenous people, we have over 2000 collectors in the Sahadu, like right? so supplying consistent jobs in areas that they need to have a job. 
Um, so all of that uh, wrapped itself up into this little, you know, Baruka nut where people love it. It just so happens that the taste of it is just kind of blows you away and how good it is. But that, that, that is a spokesperson for what I was just describing. That is the, a wild food supporting a wild area. Plus the last thing we did because of the deforestation and you realize that why I'm talking about regeneration from a holistic standpoint is we can no longer afford on any level as business owners to not look through the lens of how every aspect of our business is supporting or not supporting people, the planet, et cetera. So with us, we were seeing the deforestation, literally driving through the Sahadu, being deforested faster than any landmass on the planet, which blows you away right there. You can't even get your head around it. Crying two times. I just broke down crying. Like it was literally life and then stripped just like right in your face. And it's like without any concern with obviously unsustainable animal agriculture and food for those animals. So that was just radical. And then we're like, okay, well, let's, let's put a goal. Let's try to plant 20 million freaking trees because they're being wiped out. Um, so anyway, that, that, that encompasses a lot of what I was talking about. Yeah. And I love Barucas. We've, uh, we've talked about them, um, in the past on this show, I'm a huge fan. And, uh, Actually, Barucas, we have a, a discount code for audi- the audience if they'd love to go and if they like to go and check them out, barucas.com. You can use code genius15 for 15% off, um, which is a nut that you, I think, single handedly brought to market in the US. Well, our, 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 our shared, uh, you know, we never do anything alone, that's for sure. But uh, between a Brazilian, Rodrigo, and a team of people, like at first I was like, Rodrigo put some time and energy into it. And I was like, well, let's promote it and get you, get you some of your money back <laughs> because I was so busy at the time. But then the more we studied, the more we looked at it, like, I couldn't let that go. And the more we interviewed people, like, I don't mean interview, like a formal interview, but went around the country and had, you know, all of this investigation into understanding the ecology, understanding the, 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 the the biology of the seed, but also the importance of this tree in the wild. Uh, once you kind of, and then of course you meet the people. And honestly, how do you turn your how do you turn your back on that? So, uh, you know, knowing that the customer is going to radically benefit, knowing that people don't have much of a choice, uh, and knowing that that nut not only was not in the U S it wasn't doing well in the country itself. And it was actually, and I'm not even joking. It was going away. Wow. Like they couldn't even afford to, to harvest and collect and distribute the, the Barucas in the, in their, in their own country. So we, at the last, last week, this guy was shutting his manufacturing door. We bought that facility and then revitalized this whole industry again. And so, and now we've got other contributors and and competitors. You're like, okay, cool. That's great. Yeah. And uh, it's a nutrient powerhouse. So, I mean, what, what a shame that would be right. I mean, in a world where, where poverty and and hunger are still so prevalent to lose such a resource would be, I mean, what a shame that would be. Well, that's, I mean, that's my point of view, Max. I mean, every time, every time you see these things. And again, like when I see these on the shelves and I know that there's some good companies out there doing good things and they're getting better and better. And, and, but there's also some horrible companies out there. Just not even, they're not even looking under the hood. And, and and some of it's naivete. Like you don't, you, you, you expect, you know, you get this white piece of paper of, you know, the standard standard things that were tested and all that stuff, but it doesn't mean much. Right especially when we're talking about the whole chain, the whole chain of custody of all of these things and how it's done. So, so yeah, I mean, we, as a global society need to not only thrive in the, the, the vulnerability of opening our mouth uh, and, but, but also not, 
you know, take empty foods in uh, that have a whole slew of consequences as a result, and also take nutrient density. And that's going to obviously upregulate and create strength in our bodies and our brains and our immune systems. Um, I don't know about you, but you know, th that makes sense to me. <laughs> yeah, me too. I want to talk about some specific superfoods and their benefits, but before we get to that, I want to tease out something that you mentioned, um, earlier in, uh, in our discussion about how you're not just what you eat, you're what your microbiota consume and how a lot of these superfoods, they're beneficial in an indirect, but nonetheless, still very significant way. It's via metabolites and, and, you know, various chemicals produced by these microbiota when they ferment the pro the, the compounds contained in these plants. Mm -hmm. And, um, and how you're ingesting something that you, you ultimately will end up ingesting something else entirely. It reminds me of, um, I wrote about this in genius foods. The fact that, you know, if you eat a very high fiber meal, say you eat a very low fat, high fiber meal, thanks to your microbiota that actually could end up being a high fat meal because what does fiber get metabolized to short chain fatty acids. Mm. So there, it's just this interesting link. I'd love if you could just go into that and also how to like, optimize the microbiome to extract maximum nutrition from our food. Yeah. Well, you know, there's, again, there's so much ongoing data with all of this stuff. And that is, you know, I've always, I've, I've leaned on researchers that I've known one, one guy kind of keeps his head down, Dr. Mosin Hermanish back in 20 years ago, he was like, you know, diversification. So you go, go, you go about simply, simple, simplistically saying diversification and diversification of, of fibers and colors and everything else is a really good plan. Right. So, and now, now we're realizing that those colors, actually, some of them can actually be that, which you're talking about feeding that microflora, that uh, microbiome and actually up regulating and creating a whole cascade of effects, not only antioxidants, but serotonin and dopamine, um, and balance within that. And, you know, and then you have, you have all of these things of, of the, the sweeping things of like how important stress is or keeping stress down. And one little quick hack that keeps cortisol down because that shuts down the microbiome, almost similar to like, I'm, I may, I'm making a stretch, but it's a comparison nonetheless, which is like when you consume alcohol of any kind, the body sees it as a, a poison and it, and it can absolutely shut uh, metabolic processes down similar to cortisol, right? So cortisol and that sympathetic response can shut down uh, and change that microbiome, especially when you're living in that from a chronic perspective. So, so there's so many different inputs, but, you know, and that, that's why when anyone's changing anything in their diet, um, that you need to take steps and you need to also, when you're, you're coming off of something and when you're going into something, people underestimate, uh, how important that is because it's the very thing that we're talking about. Like one person can be receiving nutrients while the other person isn't even able to, right? So, so we've gotten into such a macro view and simplistic reductionism as it comes to nutrition. It's just, it's just so much more complex than that. So I go back to like, I mean, listen, I'm a big fan of fiber, like, you know, diversification of fibers and colors and all of that stuff. And now more than ever, uh, you know, that's what I would walk into more than anything else. Uh, and then, and then stress, uh, deal with stress. And then, like I said, like this other, these other topics I'm getting into because of fatal convenience, we're realizing that, you know, and I'll just say this, you know, for example, bisphenol A, which shows up in canned products and water bottles and, and plastic that's wrapped in food, that one compound alone is a hormone disruptor. Mm. Right. So it binds to estrogen receptors. So the body feels like it's got more estrogen for men. It actually slows down and stops testosterone. Um, and it also does this other thing. There's a compound in food called, and I can get into this more, but it's called 
osmotin, and it's in every food in small amounts, but it turns on what's called adiponectin. And adiponectin, when, when you have a high amount of adiponectin in your body, it can literally start uh, de downregulating all inflammation. It's very connected. You can, everyone can look this up right now. Adiponectin connected to dementia, Alzheimer's, uh, Parkinson's, all of that stuff. So literally this one compound, and we're only talking about three mechanisms here. We're talking about estrogen dominance. We're talking about testosterone plummeting, and we're talking about the disruption and the shutting off of this adiponectin, which is a body healer of magnitude in the body. So that's one chemical at the same time, all of that metabolically, it's doing this other thing. It's shutting down leptin, mm. right? So now that's intimately connected to your leptin. It's actually, it's a term called, um, uh, Yeah, I forget the term. It's there's a certain uh, fat term that they're calling that, but it's but it's now connected to. We can do all the thing, and listen, you and I have dedicated our lives to nutrition, right? And 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 doing things that are optimizing nutrition, but at the same time, you know the 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 chemicals in the park are, are in the parking lot doing push ups <laughs> ag against our own metabolic hormone brain uh processes that are literally taking off and flying towards heart disease diabetes um uh, motility uh reproduction uh 200 chemicals uh and this was like a decade ago 200 chemicals are in the umbilical cord of every american woman upon birth of their mm. ch children so so i i i can't even get around this conversation anymore, because if we are going to talk about health, we also have to look at all the things in our modern day world. That's literally feels like it's going exactly the opposite and what we need for our own health. So, and that's just one chemical, right? One of, this is going to sound freaky. 60 to 90,000 chemicals that are created every year, of mm. which maybe 10% are studied at all. Wow. Maybe. So, so that, anyway, that's, I've been focused a lot on, on that stuff because it's, you know, it came about my father uh, in the 90s had chemical sensitivity disorder. And so when we would go around my father, we couldn't wear the normal deodorants that smelled, uh, laundry detergents, all of this stuff because he was, and it's, we're recording this on Veterans Day. He was a veteran that worked um, on atomic bombs. He was, mm -hmm. it was called the keeper of, he was one of a small group of people called the keeper of the dragon, which is a freaky name when you think about it for an atomic bomb, obviously. And his thyroid was annihilated, right? So it set him on a course. He couldn't deal. We all shouldn't be dealing with this, but he couldn't deal with the excess of chemicals that were hitting his body and therefore had this chemical sensitivity. And therefore in the nineties started educating me and my family on all of the undercutting that this chemical soup that we've been creating in all of our, I mean, do you know that there's fire retardants in televisions? It's insane. It's insane. No, we're being we're being bombarded. It's like the Hunger Games. It's beyond for the average person thrust into battle unwittingly, <laughs> with, yeah, so, with defenseless, right? Defenseless, defenseless, so, and blind, blindfolded. Totally. Because these chemicals, they're invisible. They're everywhere, mm -hmm. and they're just yeah. You can't avoid them at this point. There's a there's a great there's a great lot that you can do to counteract. I mean, there's certainly more and more companies creating better alternatives. Um, and, and you can do a lot to mitigate this exposure, uh, for sure. But, you know, to get rid of it completely, it's like, no, we got to make bigger swings to get industry to change, uh, which I also, you know, getting 
now getting in the position of people kind of coming at me from an environmental perspective and other solutions, uh, I'm starting to see big, big, big companies uh, taking some big swings at changing these industries. And it's exciting, you know, and like plastic alone is such a monumental issue from so many different uh, chemicals and exposures uh, that there's, yeah, there's this great company called Footprint us.com and they're they're working with cargill mcdonald's pepsi they're literally uh walmart they literally created plant-based fibers waste products and created alternatives to single-use plastic right so so there are companies doing it and so there is hope always hope and there's always a solution um but some of these things are proliferated uh in the society and uh you know, one thing, stepping all the way back to maca, we were one of the first people to realize that maca, which is literally 10,000 feet plus in the Andes with nothing else around, was being inundated with heavy metals from illegal mining operations all throughout the Andes. So you're like, holy shit, like nothing's safe. Like nothing safe. So the naivete of testing any product, you have to, you have to test all your products for a handful of a growing list of chemicals that are permeating in our environment, just to be responsible to as business owners, to be able to put things out there. So it's, it's crazy. Yeah, I'd like to blow the whistle on what I think is a is a massive scam, and that is BPA free. You know, <laughs> if you're if you're consuming anything out of something that says BPA free, but it's plastic, there are other bisphenols in that product. We need to make a a, a call to manufacturers yeah. to to state to to remove all bisphenols. Yes, and to state bisphenol free. I want to start seeing that on plastic bottles and cans. I'm really happy you brought that up because it, you know, there's, and it's just literally the, the whole chemical industry is just going, Hey, what's the chemical that, that we're getting pressured on. So then we'll just divert around it, create BPA, uh, BPA, E BPA, BP, like there's all different. And by the way, it now is turning out that these alternatives to the BPA is actually infinitely worse. So the the you know we think we're winning, but with the very very poor regulations that aren't being regulated at all. Like this is the crazy thing, Max, is that as I'm researching so much of this for the book, I realize that these agencies are are just not performing. They are, I've read articles where the FDA calls out a certain, uh, could be propylene glycol or could be in the clothing industry, formaldehyde. And even these watch groups are calling it out. They yet they're, they don't do anything about it. Hmm. You know, Teflon and dental floss, for example, like it, it was even reported and glide dental floss uh, got slammed and it's still there. Like, so I don't get it. Like, how is it that we have EPA, uh, USDA, FDA, FCC, you name it. And yet they're completely failing at their job Mm. because this is not being regulated in a way. So then what has to happen? I got to write a book on it. Uh, the food babe has to create her whole career on things that are showing up on the food that absolutely should never be consumed under any circumstances whatsoever in any amount. The fact that we have this in our society is a complete and utter fail at our society, which is then just poking the bear at when are we going to get the idea that profits over nature and health is a good idea. Mm. Like really, when is it enough? Because we're killing ourselves 
as a, at the hands of this stuff, which is why as a population of people, we have to push back and we have to say, whoa, I am not going to vote with my dollars anymore for companies doing that, period, right? Just not going to do it. And here's some alternatives. You still can have the conveniences in your life, but we have to be aware. And it's just astonishing, Max. Like, it's, it's just like almost on a weekly basis, I'm literally just like scratching my head, just mm-hmm. going, what? the hell is going on? How is this possible? (laughs) Yeah. I mean, you must've seen the study that came out a few weeks ago where they looked at fast food and they found alarming levels of phthalates, right? Which are another type of endocrine disruptor comparable to, um, you know, in their nature to phthalates, they're uh, to uh, BPA and other bisphenols, they're yeah. plasticizing compounds. But I mean, these are, these are known endocrine disruptors and we're just, yeah. we're, stuffing our faces with them, yeah. right? When we eat fast food. Now, fast food is obviously like nobody eats fast food and thinks to themselves, oh, I'm eating a healthy meal. But you should be entitled to eat what you want without necessarily ingesting toxic chemicals that are going to set you up for developmental problems, infertility, and a whole host of other issues. Yeah, as plasticizers and thickeners in the fast food to keep this together and and the uh even the bisphenol that's actually on the wrapping paper of this fast food. Like, yeah, the phthalates show up in so many different categories. I just don't, again, I mean, I'm going to go out on a limb here. It's almost like, it's almost like, it's almost like they're trying. It doesn't, it just doesn't make sense because as, as someone who's been deeply involved in the supplement industry, Deeply, right? Screaming at flavor companies until finally you could get one that is doing water extraction purely and 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 uh, and and concentrations of water extraction and not chemicals and not flow agents and not proprietary anything. Like literally screaming at CEOs and seeing like, and then you look to the FDA and you're like, oh, the bylaws are allowing it. Like, okay, how did that happen? How did that happen without the population knowing? Where is our vote? If you're, if we've said that FDA, you are supposed to regulate, and so when you say yes to something or no to something, that's supposed to have some efficacy. Mm. That's supposed to organizations, hell, government is there to protect us and our freedoms, not to slide something in, you know, and, you know, yeah, it's it's crazy. So, you know, the phthalates, I, I mean, I'm shocked and then I'm not shocked because almost in every category, these things are showing up everywhere and they are some of the, the the phthalates that are showing up in the in newborn children already they haven't even had a chance they haven't even had a choice but yet as a society we made those choices for them and it's not it's not okay no uh, you just have to think about take a moment before you eat, before you eat anything and and just take a moment take a beat and think about how that food ended up whatever that food item is how it ended up in your hands. Did it have to flow through a Byzantine network of soft plastic tubes <laughs> to become the food-like product that you're holding in your hands? Because if so, it's probably loaded with plasticizing compounds Yeah, among other industrially produced chemicals, right? I mean, if it, if it had to f- flow through tubes or be wrapped or stored in vats, chances are, you're ingesting endocrine disruptors. Yeah. And that, you know, it's, it's, it's so permeated and it's, and it's, 
there's a great documentary called that just released. I don't know when this is coming up, but it's a documentary called they're trying to kill us.com. Wow. And it's f- food scarcities, um, food scarcities within cities, right? Underprivileged. They don't even know where their food's from. They don't even know what an apple looks like literally for most of their life. And their choices are the seven 11s and these other things. And it's like, how, how, how is that? And that's not okay. It's how is that happening? It's not okay. If it's not okay, can we do something about it? Of course we can. So this is the thing we, we do have to come together. And, you know, I, I also, you know, I'm a massive environmental supporter, but I'm, but I'm also a common sense supporter more than dogmatic political ideologies about all of that stuff, which it has now become. So think about it. And what you're suggesting is let's get back to our instincts. Let's get back to our knowing. Let's get back to our olfactory sense of food selection because they knew fat, sugar, salt was the easiest way. And now we have chemicals of four things, fat, sugar, salt, chemicals is an easy way to override our instinctual olfactory taste receptors, um, fresh food receptors. We know when something's fresh. We know when our body wants to consume something. We, we are the only mammal on the planet that has left our food out of the equation of selecting food, right? But when you alter food in any way, everything's up for grabs. Mm. That only works when something is whole and fresh and unmanipulated. So we haven't been given the chance. And so I am less and less about any sort of shame for someone for not being ideal weight, or it's just literally so much is stacked against so many people, especially the underprivileged areas. It's just the deck is stacked and we need to solve that problem. And also like, uh, like you talk about the UN, like I turned down going to the UN, uh, at COP26, because I was like, yeah, they're good people doing good stuff. Yeah, I have a lot of friends doing a lot of great things and are at that UN uh, conference. And I don't think they're doing the best job in the world. I have seen children dying of waterborne diseases and thousands die every day, thousands. And Food scarcity exists when we literally today have well over 10 billion people's worth of food right now. Easy. But our systems are failing us. Our systems of getting that food to people is failing us. When we're sitting there going, this is a whole bunch of food that that an apple with a brown spot on is being thrown away and not given to someone that can nourish that person. What the hell? So, so yeah, I mean, these things, dude, (laughs) (laughs) these things are, you know, the, the, the extensions of 20 years of superfood hunting, I can easily just focus on superfoods. They're amazing. There, there are plant medicines. They, they can create my career for the rest of my life with an awe inspiring ease. And that continues. And at the same time, once those blinders open and you see things in the world that are injustices and don't have to be there, I can't help but to shine some light and to raise that level of awareness so that we can all together. I love people, you know, uh, we're recording this again on Veterans Day, like Fuck, man, we've had some amazing people fight their, you know, put their lives on the line. And we need that same level of protecting us, our children, our wives, our daughters, everyone from this invisible monster. 
It's an invisible monster that is harming us every freaking day. And so common sense to me doesn't make sense to use chemicals that are undercutting the very organizing regulatory system of your body. <laughs> Just doesn't make sense. If you want to manipulate someone's operating system and make it, you know, come apart, then keep doing what you're doing. Keep putting those specific chemicals in your products and expose the population of people to it. Keep doing that because it's definitely going to wreck society. Keep putting formaldehydes and dyes all over your clothes and put it close to your skin. Horrible thing to do. Seeping into your body. The, the clothing industry, oh, second largest polluter next to the agricultural industry on the planet. And we are, we are destroyed. So of that, nearly 50% of the clothes that we're creating and fast fashion is wrecking this planet. And it's causing a lot of other hormone disrupting symptomology into people because they're putting clothes on their body and it's going right into their skin. So it's like, well, if you could see your heart beating, would you have a little more, uh, kind of understanding that that's a precious organ. Well, your skin's an organ. And so now you realize 10,000 liters of water it took to make your shirt. Wow. And of that, over 30 tons of, excuse me, over 41,000 tons of chemicals every year has now created clean water into chemical water and is now all over in our planet. So it's like, I'm not here to bum people out because like the shirt I'm wearing, it's all hemp, no dyes. And if it was dyed, actually season two of down to earth, I had a really good friend of mine who's in the fashion industry create all my clothes and he dyed them with plants and walnuts he used for one pair of pants and they, they're amazing, <laughs> right? They feel so good. And it's something what, you know, you know what it's like when you align yourself with your values, when you put things in your food, in your mouth that are, Hey, I know that farmer. I, I may even know the compounds of this food that I'm ingesting and man, it tastes really good. And I'm supporting this whole line. It feels good. Right. You feel good because you, you're literally your one person is in a contribution of something different that stands for something different. And so that's what I that's my inspiration here is that there's a bunch of us that want to know. And there's a bunch of us that want to change things and we can. And there's a lot of companies because even though I say all this stuff, there's thousands of smaller companies and and also like i said with footprint bigger companies doing the right thing you know so yeah it's it's so i say all this stuff i mean because now all of this and a lot more is a part of our health is a part of my health your health our children's health our community's health our global health it is so i can't just focus on superfoods because i can't turn off what it is that, that, that I now know, right? So as you very much are as well, you become a spokesperson for that which you care about deeply and you share from the perspective of where you're coming from and you share. And if it can help people, poof, it's a life well lived because we're trying to change that which is undercutting our own society. So that, that to me is like, it's everything. And it's. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is knowledge that you wish you could unsee. Right. But you just, (laughs) you can't. Well, not only that, you wish it wasn't there, but then you're like, wow. Like, how is it that I'm seeing this? And it's real. (laughs) Like, Yeah. How, why would someone put this endocrine disrupting, cancer-causing, metabolic 
horror show <laughs> in our food. What? Mm. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I wish I, I wish I had an answer, but Darren, you know, we're, we're very lucky, right? We're yeah. relatively affluent. We live in Los Angeles, right? You're in Malibu. I'm in West Hollywood. So these are major cosmopolitan epicenters. We have access to some of the best natural food supermarkets on earth. I mean, yeah. we're both pretty well traveled, right? Like I would say that our access is bar none, some of the best on the planet. Mm -hmm. How can like, how can average people, people who are not living in LA, not, um, you know, maybe working paycheck to paycheck, like what is, what, what are the low hanging fruit? What's the low hanging fruit for that person to reduce mm -hmm. their toxic burden? Well, first off, I would say that let's just stay on clothing for a second. Just don't buy, don't buy clothes. Don't feel like you need to buy clothes all, all the time, right? The fat, fast fashion. And, and so reuse, there's some incredible organizations, like literally incredible upselling vintage clothing that Max, I bet if you went on there and you see some of this old Nike shoes <laughs> and things, it's like, I was blown away going, Whoa, that's so cool. And there's a lot of generations of kids now. My goddaughter, who I hired, she's 25. She graduated from Emerson. She is like, literally, that's all I, she goes, Uncle Darren, like, that's all I, or, that's all I get. Cause I love it. It's unique and all of that stuff. So number one, we can, we don't have to buy into this. You need new stuff on a food perspective. I would say the easiest you want, you want the most nutrient dense salad in the world sprouts, get some seeds, get some organic seeds and you have a Mason jar and you can either put a, a rag with a rubber band, or you can get like a little mesh top, which you can get for a couple dollars and screw that on. You soak your seeds for eight hours, drain that water. You add water to it twice a day and drain it out keep it upside down. And in five to seven days, you have a full salad and you keep a couple of those going. And next thing you know, like, I mean, come on, we can talk for a day on broccoli sprouts. Literally broccoli sprouts are infinitely more nutrient dense nuts than the matured broccoli. Right? So, so you can literally eat thousands of little broccolis, right? that you can throw in. And I'm telling you, I, I recently, I've been just going crazy because I've been doing lentil sprouts and array of bean sprouts. And of course, uh, zuki sprouts and, and broccoli sprouts. I've been doing just a ton and my God, the freshness and the antioxidant capacity and the sulforaphane and broccoli, the, the anti-cancer, the immune modulation, unbelievable. And how much did that cost? Each can? What? seven cents, 10 cents, whatever it took for three tablespoons of those seeds. So from a food perspective, we can get really smart. And listen, if you have space and I'm literally, you can have a barrel garden and have a lot of soil and you can create probably on average three salads a week and you could have it on your deck. You could plant a mint leaf. You could start growing food and then that food is in information from your environment too. So that's a whole other discussion, right? So there's a lot we can do from that perspective. And then from, you know, there's a lot of personal care stuff we need to, you know, that's a massive conversation. Once my book's out, we can get down on the rabbit hole, but, you know, fragrant free laundry detergent, you know, don't toxify your laundry. Uh, sometimes we get used to that's what my clothes smell like. And they're just full of uh, endocrine disrupting toxic compounds. Mm. Um, so you can change that. And, uh, you know, maybe like I mentioned the dental floss, that super glide stuff full of Teflon, you're putting that right in your mouth, going to it, increasing your risk for, for kidney cancer. So get rid of that. I get uh, a bamboo charcoal uh, dental floss. All I do is put it underwater. So it makes it a little slipperier and now boom, it's, it's, it's no big deal. So you can do little things like that, but you know, again, toothpaste, uh, deodorant. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Deodorant's a big thing. It's right underneath 
connected to the lymphatic system. Mm. So you definitely want to stay away from that, which you can't pronounce in your deodorant and go to food based. Um, and you have to be aware of pHs with that and natural, I think, um, Salema Masakella, I think he's in connected to uh, Hume, uh, H-U-M-E, I believe, is a good deodorant. Um, Schmitz is a good deodorant. Uh, so these things work and they're great. And uh, again, you know, I think of if you can ingest it, it's good to put on your body. So things like it's that. Am- it's amazing how much we've stigmatized like the natural odors of the human body, right? Like if it's anything less than spring fresh linen, right? <laughs> like, oops, you stink. But like, and then, and then and we place moral judgment on that, right? But that is not reality. That's something that has just been drilled into our heads by the makers of Febreze and all fabric detergent, you know, like all tied, like, you know, it's glade. And and so we've saturated our lives with these fake scents, right? Exactly. And, and like you talk about colognes and perfumes, it's a whole nother discussion, how, how horrible they are. I mean, you just turn yourself into, if you want a nice smelling thing, like flower essence and essential oils, not only do they smell amazing, they literally, I, I breathe better when I, when I take in this natural peppermint or a rose or something like that, but it's also working on the subtle bodies of your body and actually not undermining yourself. So again, if you look at regeneration as a theme of your lens that you look through, follow nature without extracting everything and then reducing down to this fatal convenience then you can follow nature and be with nature because you are nature and you can find these different things that are going to play a lot better on you and your life because every habit is creating the seat of your future so everything you do as you know Every you look in the mirror, that's the food that you ingested. That's the attitude that you're having. Your the mirror is providing you the lens of how are you doing? Like, are you weak, tired, beat up? Uh, okay, what have you done? But you can do it now. You can make choices now, and you don't have to be overwhelmed with this. But just one choice at a time creates more and more. Because you know this too. It's like you don't know how good you can feel until you have the experience of feeling better. So sitting, we get used to feeling a certain way. Is that optimal? Do you have energy? Oh, you don't. Okay. Well then maybe start looking at some of these things that are undercutting your own energy systems and start making choices uh, that will counteract that. Absolutely. You know, I think and I'll, just going back to scents for a second, mm-hmm. like the, like the natural smell of the human body, like a lot of the odors that, that, that we emit are, uh, mediated by microbiota, right? Like mm-hmm. you have a microbiome under in your armpits, you have a microbiome in your yeah. mouth, yeah. you have a microbiome in your, in your groin. Yeah. Um, you know, like a lot of people will, if they have bad breath, they'll rinse with antiseptic mouthwash and that becomes a vicious cycle, right? They have bad breath. They rinse with antiseptic, antiseptic mouthwash. But what if the antiseptic mouthwash is creating the bad breath because exactly. you're just decimating your microbiome every time you swish with it, allowing these opportunistic pathogenic bacteria to take hold and create those smells. So I think it's, it's such great advice to look at like self-care, personal care, the products that you use every day, get rid of the fragrances, all the synthetic crap Mm -hmm. and stop trying to nuke your microbiome. You you nailed it because, you know, again, we're nature. So if, you know, I remember swimming in the great barrier reef and when you go down and look at it, something that's an inch in circumference, you realize that's a whole world. It's a whole world of life. And you, you said it beautifully, every section of our body essentially is its own balancing and defending ecosystems. And I did a fatal convenience on mouthwashes, right? Mm. So, and that very thing, because it, it literally is 
changing the microflora and antibacteria. It's like antibiotics, clean, clear cutting your beneficial bacteria. And it's literally then promoting the imbalance of that beneficial imbalanced unbeneficial bacteria to proliferate. So, so, so that idea of germ theory as we got to annihilate everything is a really horrible understanding of the complexity of the bio biology and the microbiological systems. And so, you know, that's, that's the, that's the thing that we need to, it's <laughs> another conversation, but absolutely. That, I mean, think about, think about the person who's they're washing their body with antibacterial soap full of synthetic fragrances, right? They're putting on the, the, the aluminum based antiperspirant deodorant full of more, you know, more synthetic chemicals, um, fragrances and whatnot loaded with phthalates, which we know they're rinse. They're brushing their teeth with a fluoride based toothpaste with artificial sweeteners. I mean, you know, there's a signal that they might not be so great for the gut microbiome who knows what they're doing to the oral microbiome and then rinsing their mouths with mouthwash. So you're basically creating the, these gut pop, the, these bacterial populations that are, I mean, yeah, they're, they're not going to be productive. I don't, I don't think to smelling your best, but they, but those products create repeat customers. Right. And so you're like, Oh, well, I'm not going to smell perfect unless I, uh, unless I use these products. But you know, the other thing is like, maybe you don't always have to smell like some synthetic, you know, air freshener that's hanging in like a taxi cab, you know, like that's how people want to smell these days. And it's not, I think that's just all marketing. It's like the result of marketing, just continually making your average person who's receptive to it feel inadequate about everything, the way they smell, the color of their teeth. hundred percent. You know, it's, you know, it's that, it's that fear-based under underpinning of marketing in the sense that you are not, you actually are not perfect. You, you are broken and we have an answer for you. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and that's, uh, that obviously as at, at the foundation of where we just dump our power. And as a society, we've given over way too much power. And so now one of the greatest things I would say to everyone, every choice, like you said, like you were talking about before you eat something, stop and question, ask a question. Where is this? What is this? What is this doing? Am I habitually do? What am I habitually doing? Is that benefiting me for myself and my life? Or is that not benefiting for myself and my life? And then just slowly start making those changes. Uh, but yeah, it's, dude, it's insane. It's, it's just utterly, utterly insane what we've done as a society. And, you know, but I'm, listen, at the spirit, of it all, once people know, some will change, some won't. There's nothing you can do about it. But exactly. And, and, but but like to honor myself, to honor yourself, we've taken these things where it's like I I'm going to do what I can do and let the cards fall as they may because what I'm seeing and what I'm experiencing and what I've read and what I've researched and what gets told to me. Uh, over and over and over again is that this isn't right. This is not correct. This is not, this is not the sense that I want to live in. There is a common sense that we have lost and I want to go back to let's, let's not kill each other in the pursuit of profits. Um, and it's not okay for any of these industries to do any of this stuff. So. Yeah, we got to change it. <laughs> got to change it. If you were dropped in the middle of the country and you had to go to uh, just your your average supermarket, what are some superfoods that your average personal that 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 you'd find in your average supermarket? Well, I, I mean, I would go. Uh, you know, I would go to the obviously the fruits and veggies. Um, I would look. I would hope that they have a number nine, you know, the, the number code on the little stickers that they put. So number nine, whether they display it as organic, that would mean it's uh, organic and not sprayed with chemicals. Wait, I don't know about this. What number nine? What is that? Yeah. Yeah. Where do, so where do you, you find, where do you see a number? 
Yeah. So the code, the codes that they put, those little stickers they put on all, all fruit and everything else, you know, and they have a four, a three, uh, a nine, a whatever. Nine tells you that it's organic. It's organically wow. created. So three and four means that it's, uh, I think, I, I'll, you'll have to check this, but three and four means it's chemical sprayed and or GMO. So it's either three or four. Um, but so you want to look for number nine. So that's what I would look for. And, wow. and then, then I would go to, and, and more and more, like I'm from a small town, a uh, very, very small town. And there are growing sections of organic choices, not many, but I would go there and I would get as much, as many, uh, uh, fruits and vegetables as I can nuts and seeds, uh, legumes, uh, great thing for me is I, I literally would go, you know, for me, I would go, you know, if I had very little rice, beans, uh, uh, veggies, fruits, like, you know, that, that's what I would do. And, and you can get yourself a Mason jar and a lid uh, and you only need like a cloth, um, <laughs> get some sprouts, get some seeds. I love that. I used to do that actually on my website, uh, maxlugavir.com. I have, um, a step-by-step step tutorial on how to sprout broccoli seeds. And I used to do that back when I, primarily when I lived in New York, I was doing it a lot more, but, um, but yeah, it's so useful. I love broccoli sprouts. The, the taste you're doing it. Oh man. Look at that. I love that. <laughs> they're, they're so easy and so it's so easy, it's so easy to that. make. Yeah. The, so beautiful. beautiful. Gorgeous. Yeah. So easy to do. And you end up, it's just like a tablespoon of seeds and you end up with this jar that's packed yeah. with sprouts. It's so great. Yeah. And if you expose it to some ambient light, then, then the green and the chlorophyll starts coming on and you amp it up even more. Hey, if you like that video, you need to check out this one here and I'll see you there. You know, and they're going to give you like our, you know, so like our, you know, grass fed beef with sweet potato and kale. You know, that's the ingredients to this, to this baby food pouch. That's what you get at a fancy restaurant. That's like your most gourmet, gourmet night out. They also happen to taste awesome and healthy food doesn't have to taste bad, right? People think it's bland or it's boring. I think, you know, it's like cardboard. the low fat vegetarian movement really made it seem like eating grass was healthy, you know? <laughs> and, and it's like, it's not, right? Like actually healthy food tastes great if you do it right. And uh, you don't have to deny yourself to eat healthy. In fact, the healthiest foods are already really, really tasty. tasty. Absolutely. A steak with some veggies and a sweet potato. Sounds like something I would eat. <laughs>